Hello, my name is Kostas Jelitakis. I work as a technical artist teacher at the Game Assembly in Malmo, Sweden. This video is a part of a larger series of videos called Getting Started with Shader FX for Maya. And in this specific video, I'm going to talk about how you can convert a Shader FX shader into HLSL code. Now, this video is not actually specifically about Shader FX, but rather how you can convert from a node based shader network into HLSL. And I'll be doing this manually. And a bit more context around this and why I'm doing this video is that at the education where I work, the students are creating game projects and I'm teaching the technical art students. And the way we use Shader FX to, to achieve creating shaders for the game projects is basically Shader FX can work as a prototyping ground for you to try out an, an, a shader or an uh, effect shader or whatever. Then the next step, if you actually figure out something which you can, uh, you, you think works nice and you want to try to get that into the game, right, would be that you start converting, you, you go from shader FX to actually writing this in HLSL code. And currently we have something we refer, refer to as the TGA model viewer. It's a tool developed by us, the teachers, and we give this to the students as a model viewer to, to view their models in uh, the PBR lighting model that we, we also give them. So basically it works as a model viewer for the students to try out their game art while they're still developing, developing and implementing their own PBR into the game. Now the reason why I'm, I'm talking about this and showing it is that model viewer is still in development and we're, we're always iterating on this to improve it. But one of the nice things I like is that it's very easy to just open one of the shader files for the model viewer, hack, hack the code to your liking and save it, and it will automatically update and refresh in the model viewer. And if you manage to, say, convert from shader FX to our model viewer, the step from going from our model viewer into the actual game is, is very little. So if you're at the point as a student where you're able to convert from Shader FX and have it working in the model viewer, then you're really close to getting it working in the game. So it might be a nice intermediary step since, since it might be easier to actually edit shaders on the fly and verify their functionality in, in this model viewer rather than directly to the game. So for that reason, I chose one of the, the uh, projects I've showcased um, earlier in this series of videos, and that is the the sci-fi health bar that I show off in the animating a texture mask video. I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a cool example because it could really be something that the students would want in their game. It's a fairly simple um, shader, so it won't take forever to, to convert an entire network. And I think it's a yeah pretty good size for, for, for a demo like this. So one thing I want to mention before we get started with the HLSL uh, hacking, if you will, uh, is that I've, I've modified to some degree this shader since the animating a texture mask video, if you had a look at that one. It's just a small change, but I want to showcase it. In the previous video, I had uh, applied a Blin Fong shader, the, the Maya native shader on the frame, and I just had shader FX here. And I realized as I would, would move into the model viewer, I, I, I would get you know this kind of UI, this texture on this part as well, since I would be fully using one shader on the entire mesh. So I figured, oh, okay, fine, let's, uh, let's just color the frame to make it look a bit more nice and tidy. And um, that gave me the idea that I can showcase another type of uh, shader functionality, which I like. I think it's, it's a simple trick, but I like it a lot. And that is that the way I distinguish between this area and this area is um, actually by, by modifying the UVs. So I'll show you what I mean. I think I've got the UV editor here. Oh, that's shader effects. All right, let me open the... the um, UV editor. So here's the UV for the, the sci fi health bar. Uh, don't mind the texture here, since it's uh, got a tiling ratio of 1 to 2 in the shader later on, it will actually squeeze and tile twice in the vertical range. So that actually works. So this is the screen part of the, the health bar, and this is the frame. And the frame doesn't actually have um, a specific texture, a dedicated texture. But what I did was that I made sure that it took the frame part and I put it in negative space in the U direction. And the reason I do that is because I can then later query in the shader and say, is the UV located in the negative space in U or in the positive space? And depending on the outcome of that answer, I can, you know, I can, I can divert and go into two ways. So currently, as it works, is 
if if the, the UVs for the given point is in positive space, it gets the result which I showed in the video earlier with the health bar and the textures. And if it's on the negative side, I just choose a flat color and use that as the output for color instead. Now you can use this for whatever type of um, functionality you want, but I just like it's, it's such a simple way of just, usually if it's a tiling texture, I could even have it like, like this. So the frame could actually fit in here if I make them both fit. But the only difference is I actually just offset it by one unit in this direction, which means that it'll still get the same texture lookup or same texture parts if I'm tiling the texture, which you usually are by default. But I also managed to squeeze in the extra amount of data saying that this can get some certain effect or treatment and this another treatment just by by being able to distinguish between the parts with the question are you in positive space or in negative space so just to quickly show how that's done in shader fx it's uh, this part so basically here's an if else um, node which is going to pass on either a true value or a false value based on a condition so if you're if you're familiar with how an if statement works in any type of programming or uh, scripting um, there's basically a condition which will evaluate to either true or false and depending on if it's true or false you can opt for taking two different paths or in inputs in this case so the way it's set up now is if this condition evaluates to true I'm going to use my previous solution with loading the textures and animating the health bar part but if it defaults to false I'll just use this um, exposed frame color which is basically just a float 3 with a cu customly set color and the way I phrase the condition is I'm grabbing the UVs from over here, my UV set. So this is basically the, the mesh UVs. I grab only the first component, which is U, and I ask with a comparison node, show you the property panel, with a comparison node set to greater than, I ask, is the U component greater than 0.0? .0? If that is true, then I use the, the texture animated part. And if it's false, that means that the value is uh, actually 0.0, .0 or on the negative end of the scale, I'll be using this color instead. And then I output the result of this node as my final output. So I just wanted to show that. I'll aim for implementing that in, in um, the shader in the model viewer as well. So I, I will do this step by step. I just wanted to showcase that this, this is actually what you'll get in the model viewer. Um, so the model viewer has a lot of functionality. I'm not going to go through it all, but one of them is that on the shader tab, I have access to four custom values. And currently I set up the custom value one to represent my health. So when it's at one, it's at full health and I can gradually decrease it here. Currently though, the increment change here, as you can see is by 0 0.1. So I don't ever get to show off the semi-transparent behavior here but if i do actually type in 75 for instance you'll see that this one is uh, partly um, transparent if i set it at 72 for instance you'll see that it it's barely noticeable and at 71 like so and yeah at seven completely gone so that actually seems to work same as how it does with maya and also the frame color with the the, the stuff i just explained is working fine as well so I realize that you as a viewer will not have access to this model viewer. You still might find this interesting. If not, this video is primarily intended for my students which we, who can play around with this editor. So in the model viewer, in the shader folder, you'll have several shaders. Not all of them are in use, but they're still accessible so you can change them around. I've, the shader which is default used by default by the, the editor is the one called Pixel Shader PBL Pack. Now this is the one I've been hacking so far, and um, I made a copy of the original one as well. So I think I'll do, I'll close the model viewer. I will make a um, copy of this one, which is my, um, just call it health bar, just for archiving reasons. I'll make a copy of this one again, and I'll rename it to the original value, which means I'm now, sorry, I'm now back to the default unmodified uh, version of this shader. And if I go ahead and open this one in Notepad++, we'll start editing this in a bit. Um, I will also just start the editor again and load up my uh, my health bar. So there we go. 
that's my health bar. This is what it would look like if I just loaded it uh, without modifying the shader. Now, currently as it stands with the model viewer, it's set up for PBR. So it kind of expects a color texture, a material texture, and a normal texture. And there's no support for you adding further textures or custom amount of textures uh, beyond this. Not yet. We're going to have a look at adding support for that um, next week, hopefully. But since I only want to prove the point that I can modify the texture like this, I don't have to settle for actually using any material or normal texture. And to that end, I can use these two textures, material and normal, to just load my other my other textures to pr prove that you can do this uh, in HLSO. So for this exercise, I will be using, you see that I've got one health bar underscore D, and that is for my um, uh, when it's full. The, the health bar M, which is usually it's a material texture, is actually the same health bar. It's actually color texture, but the, the secondary texture, which I lurk between for when it's empty. And uh, the health, the sci-fi health bar N, which I don't get a thumbnail for for some reason. Oh, right. That's probably because that's the BC4. And that's my mask. So I'll be repurposing just for this exercise the point that the, the material texture and the normal texture actually represents my empty health bar and my mask to drive the effect. Right, so I'll go back to the shaders folder. I'll need to open a few more files here in a bit. But if you have a look at this shader, um, the, the thing we're actually interested in is what's mostly interested in is what's going down on down here. Now in this video, I'm not going to go extensively into how you write HLSL shader code. I'll just try to mentioned some basics and and hopefully that should be enough just to get you started i myself am not that um familiar with writing uh, hlsl code i mean i've done it sometimes but usually i'm just used to working in a, in a node-based um, interface the nice thing is though that all these nodes in maya are basically named the same thing as the hlsl commands are so for the most part if you're using, say, a step node or a lerp node or something similar in, in the JRFX, the HLSL code or command is called the same. And also, if you want to Google a question, you basically just type um, step HLSL. And if you want, you can add MSDN, which I think is Microsoft's uh, developer network site, and you'll find the proper documentation for the step node, uh, the HLSL step node on the Microsoft uh, site. And also, of course, you can look beyond the Microsoft site, but that's a good resource. Right, so what I was saying is that this part down here where it says pixel output do pack PBL, this is actually where most of the, the logic is done. All of this other stuff is, is mostly structuring and predefined uh, calculations for how to do standardized PBR type um, calculations. So if we have a look here, I, I, I need to start with just... Um, setting some fixed values and, and um, handling the, the repurposing of uh, the texture inputs. I mean, you could, you could start in different ends of this one trying to implement, but um, I think I'll just go ahead and start with trying to repurpose what the textures are doing and then implement the lerp node without the, the animated logic just to, to be able to, to lerp to see if that works. So uh, if I go back to having this and this, uh, let's just have a look at what we have down here. So you can see that there's something called float perceptual roughness, and that seems to be de um, defining a new variable and then looking at what appears to be sampling the texture, right? It's sampling the green channel from the material texture. And that's not what we want to do, right? Since material texture actually represents our empty uh, health bar. So what I'll go ahead and do is I'll hit Control D with Notepad++ just to copy the row. I'll type two forward slashes, which actually comments out this row. And uh, I think I'll actually go into language and set it to C sharp. Now I know that this is not C sharp, but it gives at least some syntax highlighting and, and whatnot. I think there is actually HLS, so you'd need to download it, I guess. Um, uh, syntax or, or um, what's it called? Yeah, language uh, highlighting. But uh, you don't have to copy and comment this out, but I just want for my own sake to see what this line said before I started hacking it. So um, since, I, since I don't have texture data for roughness, I'll just go ahead and set the fixed value. And since this is a float, I can just type a decimal value straight like this. So let's just try that, should be fine. 
And now if we hit save, we should actually see it immediately updating here. Uh, let's actually rotate the light so we have some specular highlight at all to begin with. Maybe then we can see if we can notice a change. Oh, that's not, I'm not that good at... There we go. Okay, so we've got some specular highlight here. As we save this, we should see some degree to spec some change in this, I guess, since we're changing the roughness value. So I hit Control S. There you go. Now you see you have a lot wider uh, specular highlight. So that you, you could see that instantly as you save here, it updates here. Now, if you forget, if you make a syntax error, or say that you forget to end your row with a semicolon, and if I hit Control S, uh, you'll get that kind of result. And it actually says um, you get some kind of error or debug handling here. So you need to be a bit careful, and and you, I understand that if you're new to HLS, so this is a easier said than done. But you need to be a bit careful with actually getting all the typing correct and and the syntax correct. And regarding syntax, I want to say that a good idea is just to look through what's going on here already. Even if you're not familiar with HLSL, but you've done some type of coding or scripting, you just start to learning learn a lot just by looking at how it's done here. You can see that. This is how you declare variables. You, you notice that you end exit lines with a semicolon. You see that you can you can access specific components of, of a, of a um, texture lookup, right? So I would assume that a texture lookup would probably sample all four channels, RGBA. But if you just want the R component, you can type point R. Um, so my point was that just by looking through what's going on, you, you start to learn a lot about how the syntax works for uh, HLSL. So I'm just going to continue doing this kind of uh, this kind of changes to this. Um, so metalness, same thing there. We don't have a dedicated uh, material texture uh, or data. So I'll just copy that one, comment it out, and set metalness to fixed value. And I'm going to go ahead and say that none of this is is metal. I could perhaps, if I wanted to, set the frame to metal if I wanted to see what that looks like. But for now, I'll just start with zero. I'll hit Control S should still be fine, nothing broken. Uh, same thing with emissive. I do not want emissive. I'll hit Control D. I'll comment this one out. I'll set it to a uh, fixed value. So 0.0, .0 semicolon. Control S. I'm still good. Doesn't look broken. Um, so AO, nope. Uh, AO is usually packed inside the normal texture, at least the standard set that we have. And I don't have an proper normal texture neither AO data so I'll copy this one comment it out since we're talking about AO I basically want to have ambient influence all over so I'll just set it to 1.0 hit control s I'm still good um, detail normal I'm not sure I need to worry about this one actually I don't think detail normal is being used currently I might be wrong um, the other one I want to do the same thing for is actually the normal data but the normal data doesn't seem to be set up in the same manner here i had a look previously to to this of course but you see that there's there's this variable called normal uh, which is being used and that is actually run running a function called called get tangent to world and using input and then the result there is getting stored so actually i could probably um, just do this and I should be able to set the normal here. And if I want the normal unaffected, um, I would need to set the float three value. And I, I think I know for a fact, but we could figure it out. If you go to this one, which should be, I guess, defined further up here. There you go. You can see that the normal, this function is sampling the normal from the normal AO texture, grabbing the XYZ component. It's expanding the range. That means that when it reads this texture from disk, if you read a texture, Unless it's an HDR texture, you're going to get the range of 0, 0.0 to 1.0, so 0 to, 0 to 1. But a vector in 3D space is in the range of minus 1 to 1. So that's why we're taking this 0 to 1 value here and expanding the range. So we, ch we, we shift the range from, min from minus 1 to 1 instead, since that's what you need for a normal. So since this function is being called down where the, the calculations are going on down here, this function is being called. The the value I get returned from here is in minus one to one range. So my ambition here is to define a normal value which which is a flat normal color, if you will. So I get no change on the model. And a flat normal color in minus one to one range should be 0 0.0, 0, 0.0, and 1.0. 
if it was in zero to one range, imagine you are editing a normal map in uh, Photoshop or whatever 2D program, you would have this one at 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 1, right? That gives you that distinct purple color. But since it's been expanded to uh, minus 1 to 1 range, it should be 0, 0, 1, hopefully. So I'll go ahead, hit Control S. Uh, let's see. Hopefully I didn't break anything here. It might be, um, still seems correct. I'm just checking the light direction here and how the specular react, and that seems to be what I expected. Probably when the results we had previously, it was uh, uh, reading that mask texture I have and uh, trying to interpret that as a normal texture, and that's why I had specular here at a very weird light angle. So this is probably more correct than what I had before. Right. So I think we're good with just um, handling all all of these um, these values which we don't have a texture for. Next step is going to be. Um, I think handling just reading these and lerping them together and we'll gradually start building in this functionality. So, um, yep. So over here I have what is referred to as the albedo value and that is running a function called gamma to linear and the, th the thing it's passing on to the gamma to linear function is the result of reading the diffuse textures RGB channel. Now I think I'll start defining some new variables here. So I'll be defining one float three. Uh, let's get a row break here. One float three called uh, health health uh, full, and that one is going to be equal to um, this result actually. And then I will be defining a new float three called uh, health empty. And if you remember, we repurposed the, the material texture and normal texture just to allow more textures to, to, um, to showcase this shader. So I'm going to want to run the same kind of code since this is, this is also a color texture. It's in the same sense that this is a color texture. But the difference is I'm, I am going to use the material texture since that's where our empty texture is currently uh, stored, right? Um, my my um, project files here I told you that this one which is labeled M so the the viewer rec the, te the the model viewer recognizes this as the material texture but it's actually containing the color texture data for the empty uh, health bar and lastly I want uh, the mask value as well um, the mask value I think this this shows in shader FX as well is actually just a single channel texture. It's a BC4 texture, which only takes one grayscale channel. And you get the, the results from that from the red channel. So that's why the preview here looks red. So for that purpose, I don't need this one to be a float three, since I'm not sampling three different texture channels, it's just one. And I'll call this one health mask equals. I do not need to, to run wrap this with a gamma to linear function call, since this is not a gamma space texture. And I should be able to just copy this part. So if we sample like this, I need to end with a semicolon. I've got this stored in the normal, um, oh, that's the normal AO texture. I think it's called ambient occlusion or something of that sort. And that texture is actually being sampled um, in this function call. So if we just scroll up here, we can see that within that function called, it's, it's, uh, oh, right, it's sampling something called normal AO. And that you could also figure that out by checking at the top. There's a define saying that normal AO uh, is is mapping to the texture definition ambient occlusion. We don't need to bother with that part. The essential part is figuring out the naming convention here, uh, so I can refer to it down here. Uh, so down here, I should be um, sampling that normal AO. I failed at copying here. I think it was yes, normal AO. Right, and I just need the red channel. Remember, I told you this is a single channel, grayscale channel texture, and it's I get the results from that from the red channel. So it's a float. I'm just grabbing the red part, and I'm referring to the normal texture, which is repurposed to hold my mask. So now I have all of these three inputs ready to be used. The albedo, I can keep that name, since it's currently being passed out on down here to evaluate the the um, bi um, bidirectional reflection distribution function. Um, 
but I need to change up what the albedo actually means. So the albedo, as I mentioned, is going to be, um, so this is this is what the albedo actually, and the albedo is, is, a, is a, the result of lerping together these two textures by the mask with some logic. So first step will be just to type lerp, right? That's the same node uh, which is called lerp op. You need to search for linear interpolate to find it, but the actual name of the HLSL function is called uh, lerp. So lerp and the syntax is same as in Maya, value, first value, second value, third value. And um, so, so um, that would be the first value if I match Maya is first my health full value, and then it's my health empty value. And then that is, you see I separate them with a comma, and then that is being um, masked or, or uh, this is my mix value. Now let's start with just doing this and see if this works. Um, I want to eventually start animating this, of course, or adding the functionality so I can change what the mask actually represents. But we can start with this. So if, it, if I hit Control S and I didn't get anything wrong, I should see this updating here. That seems to work. You can see that it's gradually doing this, which implies to me that this red mask, which is gradually doing this, seems to be um, working as intended here. Now, one thing I've almost forgotten to fix is the fact that the, the texture placement is obviously wrong here, right? And that is because um, I need to tile the texture twice in, in the V direction. You can see two representations here. And I haven't accounted or, or fixed that in here. So I need to be uh, doing that. And um, one way you could do that is you see that these samplers here are referring to a variable called text. And text is currently holding my UV coordinates. And you can see that the, the variables are actually defined up here. So text is a flow 2 because it's U and V component. And that is composed of this type of syntax. We don't need to worry too much about this. As long as we are aware that this holds the UV value. And we know the logic to tiling is actually just multiplying. We can then choose to multiply this by a float 2 which should contain 1.0 because we want the u value unchanged and 2.0 to, to multiply the v value twice and that should give us two representations in the vertical axis. And as I hit control S, I should hopefully see that the placement looks better. Yes, don't worry about the frame, we'll add another color there later, but this is now looking correct. I can actually disable the UI to not have to see that uh, Y um, axis representation in, in the way of the actual screen. Now just to show that the text value here, yeah, I think I mentioned, but that's being used. So as soon as I change this up here, that new updated value stored in text is going to be used by all of these three texture samplers. All right. Um, we could actually go ahead and fix that frame now while we're at it. So in order to do that, if you remember, the logic of, of how to do that was to add a, um, a if statement. And so that is after I've got my, my lerp together albedo value, I would want an if statement, uh, which is going to query the UV if it's in positive or negative space in the U direction. And if based on if it's true or false, I choose my already existing albedo value I have and another, uh, and another fixed uh, color or uniform flat color. So I think after we've done this, I think that the, how you define this is you can write an if statement in HLSL. You can ask if text, text is this one, right? And to get the U component, I could write X, since that is going to give me the first um, component. You can type, I think, X, Y, Z, W, or you can type R, G, B, A works as well. But I'll type X. If that one is bigger than 0, 0.0, and then I should wrap it with these curly brackets, if I'm not mistaken. So I'll do an enter, enter, oops, like so. So, um, and actually, I think I want to, to switch this around, actually. If I say that it's smaller than 0, 0.0, that means that true is going to be when it's in negative space. So this condition um, is going to evaluate the times value comes from. Did I, did I break something I had going on here already? Or? Oh, okay, that's odd. Um, 
Yeah, there we go. And switch this around. So I'm currently asking, is the U coordinate smaller than 0.0? .0? And that is when I want to set the albedo to a fixed color instead. So albedo is already defined. So to just change the value, I can just type albedo equals and the new value I want to set. So this is the, the frame color, if you will. And if I want this to be a grayscale value, I could just go to 6 perhaps, 0 0.6, 0 0.6. And let's just see what that looks like. Remember, I need to end with a semicolon. So if I hit Control S, and let's see if that works. Nope. Uh, for matching one parameter function. Undeclared identifier input. I think I managed to break something. Uh, let's see. Still looks correct. Uh, if text x, this all looks correct to me. So, at the risk of me missing something very obvious, I'm just going to go ahead and undo. Since I'm a bit unsure if I actually ended up breaking something, I think I'll just redo that part. Hit Control S, see if it still works. Yes, I'm still good. Since uh, it's still displaying the model here, um, the the shader code is working. So let's try this again. After I've added uh, changed my albedo i should be able to add a new if statement oh i think i know what's wrong the syntax for declaring a if statement uh, i think this needs to be in a parenthesis so let's see if i'm right about that if i hit so i just wrap this in a parenthesis if i hit control s yes that worked fine so uh, 0 0.6 now represents my frame color okay I mean, I could tweak that, but I'm good with this. As long as I don't have to see this texture displayed incorrectly here, that's, this looks a whole lot better to me. So I think the last part we're missing here is actually being able to, to modify this to, to drive the health bar motion depending on the health. Now, this health is, is obviously an exposed value with uh, which uh, the user can play around with. And the cool thing, which I mentioned about the model viewer, is that we actually have access to four custom values, which the user, uh, me changing in the interface, can, can change around. Now, the way you could figure out how to work with this is if you, in the, the shader folder, check out the file called shader structs, and you, uh, let's see, I thought I had already set it to be Notepad++. All right, I should be able to um, drag this into Notepad++. There we go. If you just scroll down to the bottom of this, you'll see um, a list of some some useful um, here we go of some useful um, constants that you can use or, or variables. Like this, my custom values actually represents these four values. You see, I've got one, two, three, four, and I've got a float four called my custom values. So the x component of this one is going to be my first value. This is my y component, z, and um, w component. Also, if you're going to do animated shaders, you can use the delta time or uh, total time. On these, I don't think they have any predefined func uh, functionality, but maybe they are just empty defined variables that you can do um, whatever you want with, I guess. I haven't worked with them. But my point is, I need to grab this name, since that is the name I can then use within here. So if I do this and write dot x, this, this is going to get whatever value I input into this field in the model viewer. So just to prove that that works, if we wanted to, we could say that we um, we set this over here instead. So instead of reading the health mask as, as the mix value for my LERP, if I try doing this and hit Control S, I should now be able to cycle between LERPing between these based on this value instead of the texture for the mask. So you can see that the connection between that custom value and this variable I just showed you seems to work fine. So I'll leave this at 1, which is 100% health. And let's just change that back into health mask. So um, next step we're going to want to do is, so we have this functionality working. We know how to access and work with this one. Uh, we're already fetching the data here. So we need to add these three steps. So if I uh, go ahead and I modify the health mask here, I'll grab health mask and I'll say that health mask um, should be, let's see, it should be health mask again. I, so I'm setting a new value and I'm taking the previous value and I'm taking minus and um, I need that, that I lost it from my clipboard, my custom value, like so. I paste that um, over here 
and that needs to be wrapped in a parenthesis. So that is actually this step where I take the, the, the mask texture data minus the user's health value and I subtract them in that order, mask minus the, the health. And the next step is going to be multiply by 10. So if I multiply by 10, and that's why the parenthesis was needed. If I didn't have the parenthesis, it would, uh, in the order of mathematical operations, multiply would go before minus. So if I didn't have them, it would first multiply these two and then subtract. And that would not get the same kind of results I'm getting here. And last step is just saturating to make sure that the LERP node does not get values that are on the negative scale or uh, above one. So I need to wrap all of this in a saturate. So saturate node is called saturate in HLSL. And I just wrap that in a parenthesis like this. And don't forget to end with a semicolon. So hopefully I should now have an updating health mask, which is driven by this here and um, does apply the same kind of logic I did as in, H, um, in shade refix. So if I hit control S, let's see if I break anything, control S. I obviously did implicit truncation of vector type. Uh, let's see. Oh yes, I forgot to actually say that I want the X component here. If I just grab my custom values, I'm getting all four uh, of these combined. And I can't just multiply that. Uh, I can't just access them like that. So I need to hit add dot X and then I hit control S. And that seems to work fine. And hopefully when, when I do this, you see that it's now gradually decreasing these. And just to verify, if I hit 0.5 here, it's going to put this one at 50%. So that should be it. That's how I converted this um, shader FX project here into uh, HLSL code. I didn't write the HLSL code from the ground up. I just grabbed the existing PBR shader and uh, hacked in the functionality I wanted just to prove uh, how, how, to, how to translate logic from here into HLSL. So I hope this has been useful. Thanks a lot.